Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. All right, everybody, welcome to the first ever Achievers Tech Talk. I'm Zach, and I'm a senior software developer here at Achievers. Um, just going to make this really short and sweet. We've learned a lot over the last six years in growing a company, especially on our technology side, and this is really our way of giving back to the tech, communi the tech community around us. Um, our first topic and our first talk ever is going to be on scalability and about our journey from Java to PHP, and I'm sure that's piqued a lot of interest, um, as is told by the turnout here today. So without further ado, our CTO, Dr. Eris Sakantinos. Thank you. As Zach Melo Move it away from my mouth, perfect. But I don't look like Britney Spears anymore. <laughs> As Zach mentioned, this is the first uh, ever tech talk, and our goals uh, for these series of talks that we're gonna do is all around giving back. We have gone through an amazing journey here at Achievers, and while I'm not gonna bore you with all the details in this talk, I'll just touch on it so you get a sense of of where we've been and where we're going and why we want to, uh, to, to give back. The community, and not just in Toronto, but the open source community, the development community in general has helped us a lot, so we want to return the favor. So uh, I will have an opportunity at the end for you to ask questions, and we also have most of our development team here this evening, so after the talk, if you want to grab one of them and have any questions on what we did, uh, we were more than happy to, to share our pains and even our successes, if you are interested in our successes or just our pains, either way. So a little bit about me. I joined uh, Achievers in June of 2009. Uh, prior to Achievers, I was the CTO of a company called Zip Local. Zip Local was an online Yellow Pages company. Uh, I left Zip Local when it got sold to Can Pages, which then got sold to Yellow Pages. Uh, when I left Zip Local, we were hitting just over 1 million unique visitors uh, on the site. When I started at Zip Local, uh, about a year and a half to two years before that, we were in the 300,000 unique visitors. Uh, uh, a month. So I've spent about seven years worrying about scalability. How do you grow uh, a technology team? How do you grow an infrastructure to get to a point where it can meet the objectives of the business? My academic background, it's boring, I just threw it up there so that you guys know. Uh, I have a PhD from the University of, Tor the University of Toronto. I did uh, postdoctoral work at, the, uh, at Cambridge University in the UK. I was the Naval Research Labs postdoctoral fellow of secure systems there. And I have some totally awesome stories around what our military can and can't do. It's actually quite cool. Maybe another talk. So what are our goals? Goals here are very easy. We want to help you not make the same mistakes that we made. As we will see, there's a lot to scalability. There's a lot to think about. We went, some through, we went down some blind alleys. We tried a bunch of things that worked, tried a bunch of things that really didn't work. We want to just share with you. Are you going to get all the answers that you've ever wanted about how to scale an infrastructure tonight? I, I hope so, but I doubt it. This is just the beginning. We could spend hours talking about this topic. But what we wanted to do was give you a, a flavor of where we've been and where we are going. We also want to give you some practical advice. Most of you here are developers or architects or I've met another fellow CTO in the audience. We want to be able to have you go home, wake up tomorrow, go in and hopefully affect your current organization. This isn't just about achievers and a rah-rah story about achievers. It's really about helping you get better at your job. So let me just spend five minutes telling you just who Achievers is, where we've been, where we're going. It won't take any more than five minutes. So what does Achievers do? Achievers is a rewards and recognition platform. We help companies build recognition programs to recognize great performance on the job, to recognize uh, leaders in the organization, for managers to recognize their employees, for employees to recognize their managers. It really is about helping an organization achieve its goals. Part of that is also a points engine. So when you do something great, you achieve a goal, you get an allotment of points. 
These points can then be used uh, to buy things in, in our online catalog. Our mission is to change the way the world works. So that's all I want to say about Achievers, but I will show you a screenshot of our homepage. So this is what it looks like. It should be vaguely familiar because it's uh, social media-ish. We have a news feed, we have leaderboards, uh, we have point balance, how many points I have, and just for reference, uh, it's a penny a point. So if you move the decimal place over, I have $2,300 worth of points in my, in my personal bank, and I could go into the catalog and redeem for something out of the, out of the catalog. Okay, so let's start, that's it. No, no more about achievers, we'll talk technology for the, for the rest of the talk. So let's start with some definitions. So when I say certain words, I want to make sure that we all agree on what those words mean. First, performance. So what is performance? Performance is a measure of how fast something happens. So when you say something is performing, you typically mean that it's going really quickly. And when you say something is not performing, you typically mean that it's going really slow. Scalability. Scalability is not performance. Scalability is the ability to handle a growing workload. The two are obviously related, but it is critical when you're looking at this that scalability is not the same as performance. You can construct a hyper-performing system that can't scale to save its life and you can construct a system that can't perform and nobody would ever want to use but scales like a dream. They are not the same thing. Now I want to, uh, want to address one of the religious topics. So let me uh, show a hands in your day job. Are you a Java developer? A few? PHP developer? Right. Good chunk. Uh, .NET, a bunch of .NET people. We have a mixture. So I, I see this question posed every once in a while on whether it's Stack Overflow or somebody writes a blog, and it's which language scales the best? Languages don't scale. They don't. To say a language scales is to not understand what scalability is. So if you ever find yourself in a discussion and the person says language X doesn't scale, I would just walk away. It's not a conversation you can win because you are not talking about scalability. You are talking about personal preference. You are talking about what the person knows. You are talking about biases. You are not talking about scalability. Now, there are benefits to languages and there are drawbacks. And we'll talk about some of those. But there is more. There is more to scalability. If all you were worried about was performance and scalability as a CTO, VP engineering, lead architect, even a developer, you're not worrying about enough things. It's also important to understand how does your team grow? You all want to work for successful companies. I'm sure most of you do work for successful companies. When I started, we had four developers. We currently have 18 developers, and we're looking to hire 12 developers by the end of September. We are growing. The ability to onboard these people, the ability to train them, educate them, have them understand the code base is as critical to the scalability of the organization than anything that can happen uh, in the technology. It's not enough to have great technology if nobody understands it. So let's talk a little bit about our SaaS platform. So what is it? So our platform is a multi-tenant architecture. For uh, people that don't know what that is, is we have one code base and one database. We currently have about 170, 180 customers. So these are our large corporations that use our software. We host all the software. Uh, and they all share the exact same code base. And they all share the, the database. 
Yes, we have controls to make sure one person's data doesn't see the other person's data, but ultimately it is a multi-tenant architecture. We have a module-based platform. Every company can decide what features they want and more importantly, what features, how they configure those features. So what they want and how they want them configured. So this has meant as we've grown, we have lots of legacy configurations. What do I mean by legacy configurations? It's configurations that we would never do today, but because some customer is paying us a whack of money, we need to maintain that. So being able to handle all these legacy configurations is one of the goals of our platform. We have to maintain backwards compatibility. We can't just break things. We also have backend processing. Our backend processing of uh, the orders that I mentioned that you can buy from the catalog, we handle millions of dollars a month in orders. They go out. We hunter hundreds of thousands of emails go out through our backend. All of this work has to be provisioned, it has to be handled, it has to be managed, it has to be audited. There is a large backend infrastructure that has to be maintained for this system to work. Okay, so let's start talking about what did our architecture look like in 2009. It was, I would say, a fairly vanilla J2EE stack. Of course, we had Java, we had Hibernate, we had Spring, we had JMS, we had MySQL. Very, very, uh, very, very vanilla. We, I don't think we were that exotic. We just had most of the standard technologies. So let me, let me, I'll tell you a little bit about architecture, but I just want to have a quick aside. Posted on Amazon's EC2 platform. Highly, highly recommend it. If you're a startup, managing your own servers is not worth your time. Are there problems with Amazon's EC2? Sure. But in terms of the value you get from running off of Amazon, there is no comparison. You can spin up machines when you need them. You can shut them down when you don't need them. The performance is pretty good. Uh, you have management consoles. The tools have come a long, long way, even from 2009. We just moved off of Amazon two months ago. And we moved off of Amazon for two reasons. Reason number one, it was getting really expensive. So we moved to uh, Q9 Networks. So we have a co-location facility at Q9. And our cost has dropped almost in two. So cost was a big factor. Second of all, the I.O. rates you can get on Amazon's platform are a fraction of what you can get if you have your own hardware. So saving money for more performance, that's just a win-win. CFOs love that type of thing. So back to, back to the platform. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw up our architecture picture. This is our architecture picture. Can anybody see a problem with it? I have presented this slide for 10 years. What's wrong with it? You know what? Nothing. It's a great architecture. It's wonderful. You've got a presentation layer, you've got business logic, you've got database, separation, arrows going back and forth. It's awesome. So what's the problem? Eris, you just said there was a problem with it. Okay, let me, let me show you a different view of the architecture. Let me give you the data center view. Oops. That's the data center view. Yeah, it doesn't look too good. So you're like, well, how do you go from three tiers, presentation, business log, database, to when did Lonely Box in the data center? Because if you're for the Java developers, you're sitting here going, but J2EE scales. It scales. Sure, it does. It does. Absolutely. You will not get an argument from me that J2EE platform scales. But the devil is in the details. It is not enough to go and grab a J2EE book. Call, say you have a presentation layer, you have business logic layer, you have a database, and go, ta-da, it scales, bring on the traffic. It doesn't work that way. So let's meet the details, or the devil, depending on how you want to look at it. What was our problem? 
I can actually summarize the problem in the next slide, and it's just one problem. Scaling was an afterthought. Sounds so simple. Oh, scaling was an afterthought. However, do not kid yourself. If you're in the moment, business is coming through the door, what you have is working. Unless you force yourself to take a step back and think about what's going to happen in the next 12, 24, 36 months, you do not worry about it. You don't. And it's, this is the same issue that I have seen in a bunch of companies that I've been in. I show up, the very smart crew of developers, I had a really smart crew of developers when I, when I joined here, you ask them to draw an architecture and they give you the first picture. And then you're like, okay, well, how are you gonna scale it? And they're like, well, we have three tiers. Yeah, but if you haven't thought about those tiers, what does that mean? You have a, plat you have a problem. So by the end, we were on the largest EC2 instance money could buy. If money could, we had money, we had 24 million bucks in the bank, we would buy more. We were stuck, we could not grow anymore. You cannot retrofit scalability, you cannot. You can try, and I can assure you that you will fail, and it's not that you're gonna fail because hey, you know, Aaron, he's up there, he's saying he's gonna fail, so I shouldn't even try. You should think about it. And you should think about it because the problem is very deep in your code. It's about the design decisions you made. It's about the little things. It's about the stuff that developers do every day. It is not about what the CTO has drawn on his whiteboard or what the lead architect has put on their whiteboard. That is not enough. It's about the decisions that the developer who's developing at three in the morning in front of his the computer, it's those decisions that are going to make or break your scalability. It's going to make or break your company. And unless you have the right design philosophy, the right way of thinking about the problem, I believe you will not succeed. So what are the issues? It's only about three or four of them. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what, what those are. Hopefully that uh, when, you, when I go through them, you will not see your own company in any of these, but if you do, hopefully I'll give you some ideas on what you can do. First one is complexity. What's the problem with complexity? So let me define how I think of complexity. It's the title of this slide. Who doesn't like magic? I love magic. When I came here, uh, we had, as I said, Java Platform, and for the people that aren't familiar with AO, AOP, Aspect Oriented Programming, it's the ability to insert uh, hooks into your code to be executed before or after any given function. And that's the simplest way of, de uh, of, des of describing it. And the way you define those is you have a file that says, if the function signature matches this expression, then execute this code before the function or execute this code after the function. Okay. As an academic, AOP is brilliant. It is totally cool. If you don't know about AOP, I actually suggest you go read about AOP. It will change the way you view development as an academic exercise. As a CTO, gave me heartburn. Talk about the heartburn in a bit. The other problem, I call it, there's a pattern for that. It was the, the, the development team, to their credit, was trying to get better. And they were trying to get better by reading about, uh, about design, reading through books, reading about blogs, reading about patterns. And patterns are something that every developer needs to know. But the number of times in my career where I've been in the office and we're going through a design, I said, oh, that's clearly the visitor pattern or that's clearly a singleton pattern, I could probably count on two fingers. It's great to think about it. It's great to understand how you use it. But you, it's not 
a game. It's not, oh, let's see if we can put a pattern in here. It's about solving a problem. And if the pattern solves the problem, use it. But I'm willing to bet you that there's always something that's just a little bit off, and that little bit off is what's going to kill you. So the, the, the development team used patterns everywhere. So it actually was pretty easy to read the code because you go, oh, they're using the visitor pattern here. And then you take a step back and go, well, why would they do that? A simple for loop would have been fine. Do not gravitate to complexity. And we'll talk about why in about three slides. The other one is an overly complex object model. Object models are great. If you're not using objects to think about your code, that's a problem. However, if it gets to a point that exactly one developer in your organization understands it, you've gone too far. We had our access control system. I can honestly say, so I have a PhD in computer security, I've done postdoctoral work in computer security, I've looked at government security models, I have seen it all. Our security model was the most flexible, the most robust, the most Swiss army knife security model I have ever seen in my career. And exactly one human being on this planet could tell you how it worked. It was so complicated. That is a problem. Okay, so let's talk about why complexity is bad. Number one, so the analogy that I gave to my developers this is like day three. It's two o'clock in the morning. The CEO calls me. Production is down. We're losing millions a minute. What are you doing? I wake up. I open up my computer. Oh, we have a nice stack trace. I'll go to the line of code. I'll comment it out. We'll deal with it in the morning. I don't understand what I'm doing. I'm looking at this code. There is magic. Functions are being called that I can't see. There is so much complexity, I have no idea why it died. So like every good de developer, what do you do? You kill the process, restart it, and hope for the best. Dies again. Because you do not understand why it died in the first place. Complexity at 2 a.m. in the morning is not your friend. If you can't look at the source code, start at the beginning of the function, and get to the end of the function without going, wow, it called 47 different functions, and there's three cut points in here, and oh my god, where's the XML file that defines what the hell this means? It's too complicated. It's way too complicated. So what does all this have to do with scalability? As you ramp your team, it's a problem. Complex systems are inherently difficult. They're hard, to, they're hard to scale at the best of times. We have a clustered environment, and so I'm sure you guys could have guessed that we have a clustered environment in our production environment. We have weird problems, totally bizarre problems. I'll tell you one of them that happened a couple of weeks ago. We have a form. We have lots of forms. The form gets submitted via a post request. Our server logs show that it shows up as a get request. How can that, the internet doesn't work that way. <laughs> How is it possible that a, that a post request, we're like, I have developers, we're looking at the code. I, we're, dis, we're into, we use jQuery to do our Ajax library. We're looking at Ajax. We're like single stepping into, I wanted to single step an assembly into the browser. How is it even possible that this post, I can see the post request leave the browser. I can see it. I can see it. But I can also see in the Apache log, it's a get request. Where's the problem? Between the two. Yeah, what's between the two? The f we spent half a day to a day looking through our code base. Why? Because you had to convince yourself that the problem was between the two, that you weren't doing, there wasn't a code path that somehow did a redirect. There wasn't a code path that 
inadvertently dropped a cookie somewhere so the server thought you weren't authenticated so it redirected you back to the home page and we have single sign on with this customer so maybe it redirected you back and oh my god it turned into a get what the hell's going on I don't understand anymore and we have a relatively straightforward code base if your code base is complicated and you're trying to convince yourself that that post turned into the get somewhere between leaving a company and showing up here you have yeah, I can't call up the CTO of a fortune 100 company and say your infrastructure screwed up it is look post get you know what's the first thing he's gonna say fix your damn buggy product I need to be able to say conclusively it's not me if your software is complicated it's going to take you weeks to convince yourself weeks you need simplicity clustered environments are hard if your programs are complicated and you're spending time trying to understand it gets harder there's just too many things to worry about the last thing you want to worry about is why something isn't working and trying to figure it all out you're going to hit a wall we hit a wall every company I've been in gets to a point where their architecture gets to end of life it happens it's not a bad thing it's actually a great problem it means your company's growing if you never hit a wall either you're a totally awesome architect possible or your company isn't growing very quickly so you can always keep up if that's not the case you're going to hit a wall and when you hit that wall you need to be able to understand why you hit it and if you can't understand why you hit that wall then you can't figure out what to do it's as simple as that and you can't forget about the people when developers show up and you show them a code base and, and, uh, and maybe your onboarding processes are better than ours not sure they could be worse so actually they're not great right now you give them the code base and say go write code fix bugs here's a feature go build tell me when you're done okay not like that but pretty close if they can't pick up the code base and understand it they can't be productive and if they can't be productive they're not adding value if they're not adding value they're not finishing features if they're not finishing features customers get mad customers get mad CEO hears about it you get fired you have to ensure that the people can easily understand and my in the my final thought on complexity complexity always increases over time I have yet to work on a system where as we write code the system gets less complicated that would be a pretty amazing system I haven't seen one yet if you start at so much complexity that nobody understands where do you go from there you go into never never land where you're just hoping that nothing ever breaks because nobody can ever fix it so let me share with you an observation so I don't have concrete data for this next slide but here's an observation my observation is the more junior you are the more you like complexity And this was so uh, as part of as, as an aside as part of being a Sequoia investee company uh, I have access to any other Sequoia investee company uh, is a phone call away so I actually sat down with a uh, the VP of Google that run that ran sorry he just retired their engineering department this guy has like 6,000 developers reporting to him and we were talking about it and his comment was that junior developers want to prove to you that they're smart and so how do they prove to you that they're smart well they prove to you that they're smart by making something so damn complicated because you'll go wow they're smart and that was just so that mesh with my picture because until you get comfortable in your own skin until the junior developers and we were all junior ones and we may even have a few in this room until you get comfortable to be able to say that solution is too complicated you don't get to a point where you can actually start making decisions to help your company out 
I purposely didn't put a time at the bottom because I don't, I don't really know. And it's very individual dependent. I know people that have been in the industry for 20 years that are probably here. And I know people that have been in the industry for five years that are here. It's very, very uh, independent of the individual. But I will assure you, everybody in this room, except for the non-techno people that I know that are sitting here, is going to go through this curve. Guaranteed. And you will go through the curve because, A, you get older like me, and just thinking through the complex problems just makes your head hurt. You just want simple. You stop having to prove you're smart. It's hard. When you're sitting down in front of a 21-year-old developer, just graduated, top of his class, University of Waterloo, University of Toronto, pick your favorite university, all they want to do is say, I'm brilliant. And if you don't give them outlets for them to be able to tell you that they're brilliant without screwing up your code base, they're going to screw up your code base. This chart is, it's one of those things that if I had this chart when I started growing up in the development and architecture ranks, I would have hit that curve much sooner. Because ultimately we're all smart. We're all smart in different ways. We all bring different things to the table. But if you're in an environment where you have to continually prove to your boss, your team lead, your CTO, VP, CEO, that you're smart, you're in the wrong job. You shouldn't have to prove that you're smart by making something so complicated that only you understand. That is not the way to prove you're smart. The way you prove you're smart is by scaling your company to a point that we just launched 200,000 people on our platform and nobody noticed. That's smart. I got a bunch of smart people working for me. And they're smart because they don't have to prove to me that they're smart. Because I know they are. So the faster you get past this, the better. So that ends complexity. Next is, I'm sure, where everybody's expecting there to be scalability problems, the database. Ah, yes, the database. So back in 2009, up until when we shut down the platform, uh, we had ORM. <laughs> ORMs make you stupid. Kidding. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you need to understand your data. Do not let the ORM define your schema. Do not let the ORM control your database. Generating reports out of ORMs is painful. Painful, painful, painful. The first brick wall we hit was somebody trying to generate a report and it took everything out. Because ORMs do not access the data in ways that make reporting easy. Now this is a, a, something I firmly, firmly believe that developers must understand how a database works. And I also find that a lot of uh, junior developers, and this can go right up to senior depending on how uh, much of the ORM virus you, you have in your blood, do not understand how databases work. They are viewed as dumb repositories. People spend their lives making databases bigger, faster, smarter. There is something there. Understand what it is. You still may love your ORM, and I'm not telling you to give away your love, but at least understand how ORMs work. Because there may be a few of you, I, don't know, I didn't see very many Java hands, so it's, uh, I, I might be safe tonight, that are saying, yeah, but, but ORMs, can they scale? Sure. No doubt about it. Is it hard? Oh, yeah. I did a quick Google. Just quick Google, how do you scale Hibernate? Right? We were using Hibernate, how do you Hibernate? Number one, number two answer was something from Stack Overflow. And this was the quote. And I quote, a good ORM will provide plenty of hooks that allow you to optimize quite a bit. You just need to spend some time learning it. Awesome. 
that's all. I just got to spend some time learning it. This is wonderful. Scenario time. Your system runs into a brick wall. Your customers are complaining. They're bitching at your CEO's in the CTO's office. You can hear them yelling. The VP engineering is in the corner, curled up. He's in the ball. They come out. They're all looking at you, and they're saying, how do we scale this? What do we do? Well, it's obvious. All we need to do is just learn all the hooks. <laughs> what? That doesn't make any sense to me. If you don't know how you're going to scale your ORM system today, why did you start with it? Why? Why? And you started with it because, well, it, it kind of like it goes fast and I can write code quickly and, and, and it, it's wonderful. You just got to learn it. I haven't met a CEO that has patience yet. And if you tell your CEO, I need to take a course, it's a three-day course, it's on Hibernate, it's actually Hibernate uh, level one, I'm just going to be a junior Hibernate guy, but there's an intermittent senior, don't worry, six months I'm going to be a Java certified Hibernate guru master ninja, we'll get scaling nailed then. Yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure you're going to be looking for work. I had one person, this, this last quote, 100% true. I'm in there, I'm going, this isn't going to scale. We can't scale with Hibernate. The way you've built it, it's impossible. It's like, I get the hooks. Nobody in this company knows. I can't hire anybody. Straight-faced. We just have to write the ORM into a new version of the ORM that solves all our scalability problems. Are you kidding me? I'm going to change one problem for a different flavor of the same problem? Can you make it work? Yeah, of course you can. Have people made it work? Of course they have. Can you make it work? I'm betting against you. It's the old line, somebody has to win the lottery. Except that person is not you. You can do it. I'm not saying if you are in a company that uses an RIM and you're sitting there and you're about to throw something at me, don't throw it at me. It's a little bit tongue in cheek, but it is, I'm being very, very serious. If you are working with ORM technology today and you do not understand today how you're going to scale when this, your load on your database goes up by a factor of 10, I would stop what you're doing and figure that out first. Because when you need to figure it out, you are not going to have the time. So you need to know your database. I believe the database should own all the data. It's got to be your repository. It's got to be authoritative. Let it do what it's good at. Because if you do that and you do run into that wall, a very simple master-slave configuration with a little bit of code changes, and I do mean a little bit, at least get your reading off of the replica. It's not going to solve your problems, but it may buy you some time. And if it can buy you some time to figure it out, then that's what you want to do. The other way to look at this is scaling your database is a well understood problem. It's understood. Please don't confuse understood with easy. It is not easy, but it's understood. And there's only, I'm going to say, five different ways of doing it. I can't name all five because I only think of two right now, but there's not that many. But you can go online tonight, type in scaling MySQL database. And I'm willing to bet you you'll have 10 awesome articles that will tell you everything you need to know about how to scale your database. Didn't say it was easy, I said you'll know how to do it. That is totally different than typing in scaling hibernate. Good luck on that one. So let's talk about sessions. So, server-side sessions are great. They're very de developer friendly. But if you store server-side sessions, you only have two choices to scale. Two, exactly two. Session replication and sticky sessions. Session replication is yuck. If this is your preferred route to scaling, yuck. This will work with two machines, three machines, Maybe, maybe four, maybe five. Okay, I'll give you ten. You won't get to ten, but I'll give you ten. 
What happens when we need that 11th one? It, this doesn't work. Session replication is very chatty on the network. And chatty on the network means under times of heavy load, what happens to your network traffic? It goes up. It goes up pretty fast. So what ends up happening for your users? Well, the user gets logged out magically because your session hasn't yet been replicated to all of your other servers. I highly discourage session replication as a method of scaling. You can make it work in small environments, and depending on your configuration, it might work for you. But in a multi-tenant uh, platform where we are trying to scale uh, one infrastructure, this just does not work. Sticky sessions. So this is the other alternative. So sticky sessions are where you tell your load balancer, when you see this request, send it over here. And that way the session is always in memory. So this does work. I've used this in the past. Uh, it does have some not great properties. One property is that if the machine fails, everybody that was logged into that machine has now been logged out. So you get a little bit of a bad user experience. But you need to be very careful when you configure in your load balancer. Or you will have all the IP addresses of one company will go to one server. So you actually then do not get any benefits because for us, we have 160 companies, they come out out of 160 IP addresses because everybody proxies their corporate data, which means that one company, so CVS Caremark, 200,000 employees would hit one server. That server isn't going to make it. So be careful. One of the funny stories I had uh, two jobs ago, we had sticky sessions. We had a customer for it was probably a, maybe days, could even have been a week. He's like, your site is down. We'd go on, no it's not. You're stupid, must be your internet connection, uh, using dial-up, like what's the problem? Well, did we all forget that we had sticky sessions? They were hitting a server that actually was down. Our corporate address was actually hitting a server that actually was up. So when we actually tried to do anything, it worked. The, none of our monitoring tools picked it up because our monitoring tools said the machine was up and really it was up. It's just that the process was not being responsive. So be careful with sticky sessions. They do work in a pinch. You, you can get there. That, that now brings me to caching. So caching is an important quality. And the problem always is when to cache. So our platform back in 2009 made extensive use of caches. Extensive. So the, the, the knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, that's a good thing. But it wasn't in our case. And so this is the downside of caching. And it wasn't because caching was used as a performance enhancement. Caching was not used as a scalability enhancement. Those two are two different things. And you need to understand the difference or you will make the same mistakes we did. When you're caching in your application because your application can't go fast enough, that's a problem. Because now you have the equivalent of server state because your cache is holding data. So now you introduce another machine. How do you sync the states up? That's a problem. If you need to cache for performance reasons, you need to look at your architecture again. You're going to have problems scaling. So the first step is admitting you have a problem. And this is really hard. It, it, it is really hard, especially as the new guy coming in. Uh, you can talk to uh, Zach, who was the uh, MC up here. He was one of the original members. It's hard. You've been working on this thing for so long. and Here's a new guy saying, wow, I don't get this. This is going to be a problem here. That's going to be a problem here. But you have to understand, never fall in love with your technology. If you fall in love with your technology, it's going to break your heart. It's not going to love you back. You're going to give it everything, and it's going to give you nothing. You're going to want it to be a doctor when it grows up, and it's going to drive a truck. Like, it's just, it's not going to work for you. It's hard to let go of your baby. If you view your technology and you cry when it's upset, 
That's a problem. You have to let go. It's just ones and zeros. You, if I can't walk into your company tomorrow, not that I would, because you'd probably get me arrested, and I can't delete your code base, and you go, yeah, I can write it better. If that's not your immediate response, you're in love with your technology. Stop that. That's bad. Because if you're in love with your technology, you can't make the hard choices. And the hard choices are what's going to separate you from your competition. The journey. So the, it, it's been a while for me to get to this next slide. Because remember that complexity curve I showed you? You have to actually get pretty far along the complexity curve to hit this next slide. And that's what a web application is. A web application is five steps. And they are so simple, even the HR ladies in the back who are sitting giggling and having a great old time out there can understand these five, these five points. Number one, the user makes a request. You validate that request. You grab some data, you divide it by two, three, multiply it by 47, you put it on a web page, and you send it back to the user. That's all a web app is. No more, no less. If you can't make that go fast, that's a problem. Where do people get messed up? They get messed up because they view number four, and actually number three and four kind of together, as, wow, this is my time to architect. I am going to architect a solution that is going to be the envy of everybody in Silicon Valley. It, people will pay homage to my architecture. No, no, you're grabbing some data from a database, you're putting it in a damn web page, and you're sending it to the user. If you have that as your mentality, you will write good, scalable web applications. If you view it as more than that, you will write very complex, not so scalable web applications. So what were our guiding principles? First of all, we were starting our deployment on three machines. Starting. Why? Because we wanted to know if it's going to work right out of the gate or not. By starting your deployment and your production pushes on one machine, you can make very subtle design choices that mean you can't add the second one. So if you don't start with more than one machine, I suggest you're going to have more problems than if you do. And now you can sit there and go, well, why not two? Why three? Well, it's just one of the things that I find that you can still get away with some optimizations for two, but as soon as you add the third, you really have to think about the problem. So three. That was going to be our minimum initial deployment. So the second one, you can argue with me one way or another, if this is just a personal preference, our servers had to be stateless. I wanted the load balancer to simply do round robin load balancer. No sticky sessions, no cache coherence problems, no s nothing. I wanted them stateless. The database owns all the data. So one of the things that I personally despise about Hibernate, but one of my developers said, yeah, but you can do this, that, okay, it's fine, I got it, is that Hibernate caches for you. As soon as you take data out of the database and cache it above the database, you end up having a whole bunch of problems around cache coherence, replication, who owns the data, who's going to update the data, how do you lock when you're doing a big transaction. Yes, they've all been solved, I get it. But if I can't understand them in 20 seconds, it's too complicated. Remember, it's 2 a.m. and I need to understand why this transaction isn't going through. I want to see begin transaction, whole bunch of SQL, end transaction. I don't want to see random stuff. Caching has to be an explicit choice. We just recently, less than a month ago, actually, believe we added uh, Memcached. I'll show you our architecture picture in a second. So Memcached, for the people who don't know, is a high-performance caching engine. Why did we just add it a month ago? Because it wasn't a problem until a month ago. It was an explicit choice. We did not need caching to achieve levels of performance. We are using caching to achieve levels of scalability. 
always use the right tool for the right job. And I'll talk a little bit about this in a second. We don't try to force things in. If the right tool is something that's, hey, we've got to go deploy some more infrastructure, we will do it. But it has to be the right tool. And finally, minimize complexity. We had a bunch of other goals. So we wanted zero downtime deployments. So yes, I know Java, you can make it work with zero downtime deployments. We never managed to figure it out. So I wanted to be able to push code to production and not have to tell anybody. Now our account managers really hate that because something bad happens and their account thinks our platform is really buggy and I'm looking at you, Paula. <laughs> yes, yes, we, that, so, but the ability to push code to production and not have to tell anybody to fix issues on the fly without taking the system down, huge win. And we also wanted to maximize developer productivity. So we came up with our target. What is our architecture? This is the, this is the equivalent of that J2E architecture that I showed you earlier. Because every scalable web property on the planet will draw you this picture. Am I able to draw you this picture? Because this is how you scale a web application. So chicken and egg here. We have a load balancer out in front. We have a whole bunch of web servers. We have a memcache D cluster. We have a network attack storage device that we use as a shared file system. We have master slave MySQL, and we have a bunch of machines for background processing. So that is our architecture. That's our architecture today. And how do we scale? It's those little dotted lines, and eventually down here, our slaves will have read slave, read replicas, where we have clusters of read slaves. Well understood scaling properties. And if you're interested in, in scalability, uh, I don't want to say this is the gold standard because maybe somebody's come up with something better, but every property that I have seen that has high traffic that you guys would know names to has an architecture that is very similar to this. And, it, and why? Because every component in this architecture does one thing and does one thing really, really well. We don't try to jam anything together. So now let me get to what, depending on the audience makeup, would have been a very contentious discussion, or it could be just an educational one. I'm hoping on the educational. The choice of language. So we were a Java shop. We were a Java shop for many years before I got here, and we were a Java shop for a year and a half or so, maybe two years after I got here. Then we moved. Why did we move? We picked PHP. Why? Because PHP has the fastest debug write code cycles there is. Okay, yeah, maybe Python, maybe Ruby on Rails. I, I get it. It's a scripting language. It has fast cycles in order for you to write code quickly. The zero downtime deployments come for free. So that's one thing I don't have to worry about. I don't need uh, in the Java world the Java expert to come and tell me how to orchestrate a orderly shutdown of servers in a row so that I can get code deployed in really weird ways. So it happens for free. And the final point to me is the most important. Because remember right at the beginning I said it's about the design decisions that your developers make in the middle of the night that are going to kill you. In PHP, it is very difficult, I'm going to go with almost impossible unless you really try, to have server-side state. You can do it, but that one decision solves a ton of problems. So the non-PHP people in the audience are sitting there going, but doesn't PHP suck? <laughs> well, languages don't suck, only the developers that use them do. <laughs> PHP isn't perfect. If you want an exhaustive list and a few rants and flame wars and a whole bunch of entertainment, just Google why PHP sucks. You can't sleep, <laughs> it's great reading. But PHP doesn't scale. Really? It's languages don't scale, architectures do. If you don't believe me, ask Wikipedia, ask Facebook, ask Dig. All of these companies have managed to build traffic that, you know, unfortunately is going to be bigger than almost everybody is in, in this room unless Facebook decides to go away tomorrow. If they can make it work, you can make it work. It's an interesting exercise to think of the number of PHP properties that you know of that are high growth, high performing, high traffic, 
and the number of Java ones. Who can give me the, what is the highest Java one? Who knows? The sports one? Amazon? Amazon. Right? So Amazon, they made it work. So everything I said, I never once did I say Java doesn't scale, J2E sucks. You know, we can have an interesting debate whether it does or doesn't. You can make it work. It's a question of effort. Then the other one I always hear is, sure, but PP slow. Yes, it is. But if your application is not database bound, you didn't write your application right. Our web servers, Scott, web servers, percentage? 15, 20%. Our database server, excluding today? Thank you. Today it was double that. Right? So we are database bound. When production has problems, it is never because of PHP. It is always because something happened in the database. A table got locked, got left, so we were queuing requests. Something in the database. Performance is important but it is not your limiting factor. When you're the size of Facebook, yeah, it's a problem because getting 10% performance means you drop 10,000 servers. 10,000 servers is a lot of money. When you're our size, 10% performance buys you 1% of CPU, whatever. Completely irrelevant. Yes, but there has to be downsides, right? Yes. PHP is arguably a screwed up language. <laughs> it's a pretty hacky project, right? Where it started, where it is, it's kind of stunning that uh, the, some of the largest sites on the planet are using it. It has some basic flaws, but if you're aware of them, you can get around them. There, it is not your limiting factor. It is not going to be the reason why you fail. Coding standards are a must. Error handling, detection, reporting, handling are critical. Our plan is to do uh, this type of talk on, on what we have done. But I encourage you, if you're a PHP shop, make sure you have uh, rigid coding standards. I know for us at the beginning we didn't, and it's now we have to go back and clean up some of the, some of the messes that we made. Hey, it's a mistake that we made. And uh, one of the our favorite religious wars is where should brackets go? Oh, we don't want to start that one. We could easily spend hours on where brackets should go. The next question, once you pick a language, is picking a framework. We use CodeIgniter. We use CodeIgniter simply because it's understandable. You can look at the source code, and in a couple hours, you will understand every line of that code. But it's a standard MVC controller, uh, sorry, MVC framework. It follows the open-close principle. You, it's infinitely extensible without having to modify uh, any of the source code. And as long as you know PHP, you need to know nothing else to use CodeIgniter. When I look at Java, you can know Java, you know a little bit more before you start writing servlets and servlet containers. You need to understand the whole Java ecosystem. Find .NET's a little bit better, but it's still similar. You need to get your head wrapped around a lot of stuff before you start writing those applications. Once again, lots of people do it. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying it is an issue, and you just need to be aware of it. Using the right tool for the right job. So it's kind of funny how the, this one is kind of weird. I've been in lots of places where we argue who should serve static content. And it always comes down to, well, static content is static. Let the web server do it. Now, when you're using a Java platform, sometimes it is easier to let Java, or not, it's not Java serving it up. It's a you know, servlet container serving it up. It's not the right tool. Because if you have Apache serve up your static content, you can move all your static content off of your main dynamic pages, stick them in a corner somewhere, have a nice clustered environment, high performance, and it's serving out static content. So just put your content in the right places. 
Uh, we have a network attached storage device. It's actually fiber connected, so we have nice, n nice bandwidth to our boxes. If you're on EC2, you obviously can't do this, even though I'm, this, I'm sure that Amazon probably does have fiber connected storage. Uh, and this is because we wanted a shared file system. So we have a network attached storage device. It is redundant, and it allows us to have known places in the file system where we can put things. So we don't have to continually query the database to find out where a file is. We know where the file path is. We just go grab it. And we have background boxes. Uh, back in the old platform, we would run all our background processing on our web server box. Remember, we had only one web server box. So just moving all of the back, background jobs onto other machines, even that bought us more performance and more scalability because it allows us to control things in, uh, in a completely different way. So what problem did we face? We had 120 customers. We had to migrate them to the new infrastructure. So how did we do that? And this is actually, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of what we did here because to our customers, they did not know what we were doing. So the migration process. Step one is we wrote a servlet that passed requests off to PHP. So we actually had another instance over here. Request would hit the Java controller. We would forward the request off to PHP. PHP would generate the page, and it would come back out. That allowed us to continue developing features, but have it appear in the old platform. So I don't remember which one of the developers came up with this idea. Brilliant idea. It allowed us the time to figure out what we should do how we should do it. It just bought us breathing room. The second step was we had to start migrating customers to a new platform. So the way we'd handle that is we put a proxy server, remember that one box, we put a proxy server right in front of it, and as the request came in, we would farm it off to the old platform or to the new platform, depending on if you were on the old or new platforms. So this, once again, allowed us, it bought us time. As we migrated customers, we tried to migrate customers that had the feature sets that we'd had developed in the new platform and not the feature sets that we didn't. In hindsight, in retrospect, you know, uh, looking back, I can think of 20 things I would do differently. But at the time, it actually helped us and bought us a lot. So what was the setup? We had HA proxy. HA proxy is a wonderful tool. I'll talk about it in a second. And it f separated the requests into the old Express platform and our new Achievers platform, and they both use the same database. So that allows us to pick up a program, client of ours, from the old platform, configure HA proxy, and it'll flip over to the Achievers platform. So we did that for uh, four or six months. You know, we did customers slowly, one at a time, then we do them in bunches, and then we got bored and just did them all right at the end. But it allowed us the time and flexibility to do what we needed to do while keeping our customers happy. So HA Proxy, if you don't know what it is, you've never used it, if you're going to do one thing after this talk, go download HA Proxy and read about it. It is a wonderful tool. We have it in production right now. We have used it to take certain traffic off of our main production sites and move it to a debug server where we, can, we have better tools to analyze the traffic. When we're done, we flip HA proxy back and it hits our production site again. This has saved us countless times when something is happening and you just don't know what's going on. You don't want to put all your debugging tools and everything on your production boxes. So we have one box that our IT guys have secured so nobody can break in, because if you broke in, there's all source codes there, there's a whole bunch of stuff there that we don't want you to see. But it allows us to move things over so we can figure out what's going on and then move it back into production. So we did it. it took us six months to migrate everybody. I would say our productivity has improved I don't want to say it's a panacea. We do have some issues. Like I talked about the coding standards that we didn't implement those early enough. There are things we're cleaning up. There are even things that we're learning today. But we know our architecture can handle the load. 
And today was a great test for us. Dropping 200,000 people into our architecture, into our, onto our platform, and having it work, that was a great feeling. Were we nervous? Absolutely, because until you get there, you just don't know. But we convinced ourselves today that what we did was, uh, was great and it's going to work in the short term. We already know what some of the issues are uh, as we go forward and we'll have to relook at them again. And as long as we don't fall in love with our technology, we'll be able to make those changes. So some conclusions. Scaling is hard. But don't make it harder on yourself. Don't make it harder than it has to be. Reduce your complexity. Understand your data face and think about upfront how you're going to scale. If you don't know how you're going to scale, I would suggest you stop, take a couple of days and figure it out. At the very least, it'll be eye-opening and you may go, I rock and this is great, no problems. Or you may go, holy mackerel, what are we going to do here? There actually is a problem. But knowing about it is half the battle. And finally, never let anybody tell you a language or framework doesn't scale. It's all in the details. You can make assembly scale. I wouldn't want to, but you can do it. It's all in the details. Thank you very much. So we have a couple of minutes for questions, if anybody has any questions uh, for me now, uh, otherwise I'll be mingling and asking, you can ask me questions uh, after. So, oh, Zach, <laughs> Mark. Okay, yeah. uh, my question is, how do you plan to scale database rights? Uh, it's a great question. So the uh, question was, how do you we plan to scale database rights? So right now, our read to write ratio, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I would say it's probably 100 to 1. So database rights are not a problem in the short term. Uh, our database reads are, are going to be our next big challenge. Uh, right before we came out here, we were actually we were talking about what we're going to do about database reads. So for that, we're going to have our read slaves clustered and we're going to distribute load across our, our read slaves. When it comes time to scaling database rights, we're going to move to a sharding architecture, which we've already talked about, where individual programs will be on their own database so that we can distribute write load. Uh, because of our, uh, our product and the way that we sell it, we can move whole companies out. So it's one of the things that allows us to scale our rights is that we don't have to worry about where, which database you're going to hit. We know you're from company X, we move you over here immediately. So sharding for the rights, clustering for the reads. Yeah. Any other major scalability hurdles that you see other than solving the database? So the, uh, the one that we are currently facing right now and we're looking at is uh, our news feed. So our news feed, as you saw just in the Queen's quick s uh, screen cap, and the reason that that's becoming a scalability issue for us right now is because we have a very robust access control model. So being able to apply all the access control rules to the database is what's causing us problems. We already have lots of ideas and we know what we're going to do there, but because our object are simple, and I mean by simple, once again, do not confuse simple with easy. We understand all of the objects in our system, so when one of them starts to run into problems, we know exactly what needs to happen. Everything is visible, everything is uh, open, so that we can go in, we can measure, and we can make changes. Yep. Uh, so that's a, that's a great question. The question was why did we pick MySQL over Postgres uh, or what was the other one? MSSQL. MSSQL. Uh, so we didn't pick MSS, we didn't pick Microsoft because we're not a Microsoft shop. In terms of uh, Postgres versus MySQL, when I showed up we were using MySQL already and there was no reason for us to, to move off of MySQL. Uh, I find that most database uh, 
we spend most of our time in the database doing selects, getting data out of the database, and then it's the scalability properties that are interesting. So when I look at how can we scale MySQL, there's a lot of examples. Uh, there's a lot of people I can talk to. So there was no, that wasn't my problem. There wasn't any issues in terms of the database to move off of MySQL. Yes? Oh, yeah, we have way too much logging. Uh, no, sorry. The question was uh, how much instrumentation and logging do we have in our system? Uh, that actually is one of our I issues right now. So when Zach asked, it, it's not a scalability issue, but it's, one of, it's actually a performance issue because we logged so much data that we noticed, um, when was it, like a month ago, two months ago, where our load on our web servers was going really high. And I'm like, why is our load going up? And it's because we were logging so much data that it was actually affecting performance. So we are still struggling to find the right balance between uh, logging so that we can figure out what happens when a problem occurs and logging too much that actually impacts, impacts performance. So that one is still, we're trying to dial it in. Yes? Yep. Okay, so the question, sorry? The number from today was 1,500 a second. Yeah, so the question was on uh, performance numbers from our database, and the answer, thank you, Zach, was we were doing 1,500 queries a second today. And the performance was? Uh, the performance was, so I'm, I'm biased, so let's ask the, how was the performance today in the system? Is it okay? Normal. Normal. Yeah, so we were processing, uh, what is just 4.3 million rows a second? Yeah, we're doing about between 4.3 and 5.5 million rows read per second, and about 1,500 So that was 4.3 million to 5.5 million rows uh, a second in terms of reads. Thanks. Yeah? Uh, you explained why you chose PHP, but what are some of the reasons you decided to go against, say, Ruby or even uh, ASP, C -sharp .net? So Ruby, I'll start with Ruby. So I actually have uh, Ruby experience in my background. Um, and while Ruby has a lot of strengths, the sheer amount of magic in Ruby on Rails was uh, actually an issue for me. So I, I, this is a true story. I'm a day into my job as CTO at Zip Local. We were a Ruby shop. We had a production problem. I'm like, not in CTO, I'm gonna go fix this production problem. I'm looking at the, con the controller, and I'm like, well, it's impossible. There's nothing in this controller. And oh, well, because if you call your file the right thing, it loads the model automatically. And if you call this file the right thing, it loads helpers automatically. That's wonderful once you get to understand it all, but until you get to a point where you understand how Ruby on Rails is put together, it becomes a nightmare for the poor developer. Second of all, we couldn't hire anybody. Hiring Ruby developers, it's, so I would interview people. It would be, I'd say, well, okay, you're a Ruby developer. Yeah, they go, yeah, yeah, give me your experience. Well, I read a book. <laughs> Not a Ruby developer, it's a guy who read a book. So hiring Ruby developers was the number one reason we, we did not, we actually moved away from Ruby. And I didn't even consider it uh, to go from PHP. Uh, C Sharp, uh, it was just too much of a mind shift for the organization where we were at. Like it was hard enough to get people to think that PHP was a viable language. Having them you know, go to the dark side was just, <laughs> that would have been impossible. So the only viable options were really Java and, and PHP. Uh, we could have stayed with Java, so I have nothing against Java. Java is a wonderful language. The, the issue is one more of organizationally. If you have a code base and you're under time pressure, you're tempted to go back and grab something from that code base. And there was, I wanted a clear break of the way that that code was put together. And so the only way to get that clear break was to actually go to a different language. Uh, there was a question, yeah? Um, so uh, does your application have any scenarios where you might need transactional integrity across a series of HTTP transactions where you necessarily can't share state? Did you have a strategy for dealing with that? 
Uh, so I actually don't think we do. Oh, so the question was, do we have any scenarios where we needed transactional integrity across a series of HTTP transactions? I can't think of any. You guys think of, uh, I don't think we have any. Uh, we have forms where you, there are multi-state forms, but nothing that needs transactional integrity across all of them. Clearly, we have the transaction being done uh, at the end, but I can't think of one. You guys think of? Yeah, like uh, product uploads, there are times where you have to write the temp file. Uh, yes, okay. Yeah. There are cases where it's the transactional integrity isn't across multiple HTTP requests, but it's across multiple backend processes that have to, that have to happen. Uh, and so in those, we do a lot of pre-flighting of work to get work all set up so that when we do run the transaction that we can run it in, in, in one shot. There's also uh, split transactions across vendor integration, too. Like Expedia, Big Jones. Yep. So we do have, uh, so I think that, that, so Matt, who just answered the, that question, was the one that did the Expedia and Ticket Jones integrations. So he, he, I can make it up, but he'll at least tell you what the truth is. Any other questions? Yes? So we currently, let me think, do not have any single points of failure. Scott? Good answer. We do not have any single points of failure. Yeah. So uh, Q9 actually gives us two redundant network connections that are plugged into two switches or two firewalls, right? and then everything behind it has, uh, has redundancy. So we have no single points of failure. That's how it was built. I was just testing. Yeah. Uh, what about your uh, MySQL master database? Uh, in terms of? Single point of failure. So we do have a uh, read slave. So we have master slave set up, and we can fail over to, to the slave. Uh, so, almost instantaneous. Yes? Uh, you mentioned you're sending a large amount of like, emails. Is this something you're doing in-house or like, with a third party? So the question was, uh, we're sending a lot of emails. Do we do it in-house? Do we use a third party? We do everything in-house. So we have our own uh, mail queue processing that happens and we, we drain the queues as fast as they get filled. Yes? Great question. So uh, one of the issues, I'm going to answer it slightly differently. So one of the issues that we had with Amazon and our customer base, so this may not be an issue for your customer base, but one of the issues that we had with our customer base is uh, security around data. Our customers wanted assurances that their data was protected. It was hard enough to get them to understand that we were using a cloud infrastructure. I was on conference calls with I will, they will remain nameless for hours and a half trying to explain that we actually didn't know where our server was. And that was one of those concepts that was so foreign that it took me an hour and a half to get them to the point where they kind of sort of almost understood that we didn't know where that server was. For me to then to turn around and tell them that, yeah, we don't know where our data, their data is, that was a non-starter. And so uh, security was one of the primary drivers for us even considering leaving uh, Amazon. So that was kind of like, hey, security is a big issue. It's costing us a lot. We get more performance. Those were kind of the trifecta for us to actually move off of, off of Amazon. So we looked. We actually actually we spun up some of them also, and, but we never went far, farther than experimenting with them. Yeah, one more question. Maybe zero more questions. That'd be awesome. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody. We will be around for the next little while. So if you do have any further questions, uh, please grab myself or uh, anybody from the development team. And thank you very much for coming out.